So I uh, think we've talked about technique, we've talked about equipment, and it's funny because probably none of it is as important as what Professor Murray just said, training. And of course, imaging, because everything we do, we must be able to see, we must be able to know what we're treating. So I'm, uh, I'm very happy to see competition between Philips and Siemens. I want them to fight to the death to get us the best imaging. Uh, this uh, uh, is the newest uh, biplane from Siemens, it's the Icono. And there's several advances that are quite interesting. One is this ability to do a scan without moving the B plane out, uh, which uh, obviously has a, a, an importance in time saving and uh, 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 prevents collisions or problems as you're moving the B plane in and out. Uh, the other is the ability to uh, visualize collateral vessels, not just with an early and a late phase, but with multiple phases. As I think was mentioned, this, this is very, very important to be able to see the collaterals very well. So with a, a, a scan time uh, of 60 seconds, you can get 10 different time points uh, and, and really be able to understand dynamic collateral filling in in the occasion of an elbow. Uh, this is an example of the kind of thick MIPS you can get with looking at the collateral vessels. And you can see in these two images here, uh, obviously the occlusion of the M1. And then on a later phase, as one of these 10 phases, uh, you can see the collaterals begin to come in and understand something more of how the brain is being fed and what the possibility is that you have penumbra there that can be salvaged. I think this kind of information is incredibly important as we make decisions uh, to be more aggressive uh, to, to uh, try to save brain. Uh, you can also see this in multiple planes. Uh, if you use VIZ or RAPID, uh, you know that looking at the uh, uh, coronal uh, pictures often is very helpful to understand the anatomy, understand where the occlusion is. This is also possible here. And then there's an auto transfer function where within the system you can transfer these uh, images, these 10 different phases, uh, directly to RAPID, have it uh, uh, looked at at a server, and, and uh, within the system uh, give you your, your RAPID images uh, on, the, on the table, which I think, again, is very important, particularly if Tudor or Raul uh, were going to skip the CT altogether and go directly to the lab. You want the best imaging that you can get. Having uh, this sort of processing is very important. And then uh, this is uh, almost a little embarrassing, but uh, this isn't called butterfly. Uh, it may look very familiar. It's the sign spin. It's commercially available. It's uh, in my uh, uh, system right now. And uh, it may sound somewhat familiar, but what this allows you to do is to uh, do a, 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 an image acquisition that is somewhat asymmetrical. And uh, this gives you dramatic reduction in artifact from the skull base. The petrous bones obviously cause a great deal of artifact. So on one side, you see a normal spin. And on the other side, you see the sign spin, where it simply wobbles on its axis, uh, almost like a butterfly, uh, and, uh, and shows you uh, a better imaging of the parenchyma because you avoid the, uh, the, the uh, artifact from the bone. Uh, so you can improve uh, dramatically the imaging you can get. This was a patient we did in the last year, uh, something very simple, uh, but it was a subarachnoid hemorrhage patient, and we're looking at the gray-white matter, we're looking at the ventricular anatomy, and of course, sometimes you uh, put a, a ventriculostomy in, uh, in the uh, angio suite. Did we lose our images? I don't know where they are recovered, the images. When you, you showed the both, uh, both flat panels working for the contrast part of the study, when you do like a non-contrast Conbin CT, it's just one system, it's just one So AI. my understanding is that right now, you don't have to move the B plane out, but the image acquisition is just from the A plane. Okay. My understanding is that in development, not commercially available at this point, would be the ability to have both uh, planes uh, generating and, and, and acquiring images at the same time. But that's, that's not commercially available at this moment. Even with this butterfly effect, you are both planes moving. That's one, that's yeah. one plane. So if you want the sign right. spin, you're going to move the B plane, plane out. Yeah, but, uh, but again, I mean, obviously, this, uh, the, it makes it obvious that, that eventually we'd like to be able to move both planes at the same time, not remove the B plane and still get the sign spin. I apologize, but I have, I have no control if, they, if there's no slides, if there are more questions. Please. You, 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 because I was told that there was no more slide in your presentation, but there are? Huh. 
that should not be. Okay, we'll, uh, okay, you will get them back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, yeah. No, it's okay. If this is the worst mistake, nobody died. It will come back. It will come back. Okay. And Adam, how long does it take for uh, the non-contrast con bean acquisition? Seven seconds. Seven seconds. So it's kind of similar to, to Philips, I guess. Again, yeah, I want them to compete as hard as they uh, can. It's, I, I actually love your knowledge. It's how things get advanced, right? It's Listen, I, you know, I was watching the cases from Bicetra, from Beijing, from Toronto. If you proctor, if you go around and you see what's available in some labs, it's very clear why these people are doing such great work, uh, because they can see everything very clearly. Uh, when you watch Laurent work, when you watch Jacques work, uh, the imaging is impeccable. And, and, and you need this. You know, if you're going to uh, be treating an ACOM with a web and pull back uh, almost imperceptibly to get the neck coverage, this is impossible with the, the quality of imaging that we had even five years ago, ten years ago. And a point that I just made was, it's not only about the hardware, it's about protocols and fine tuning and training techni the technicians properly as well. Okay, I think we're back alive, so I'm just going to advance quickly. So this was simply showing a, a ventriculostomy in place uh, that was put in in the lab for a subarachnoid hemorrhage patient. Uh, also, you can visualize hemorrhage. Uh, here's a, a case uh, from uh, uh, Germany. Uh, and uh, there was a thrombectomy done, and, and you can on the table immediately see the contrast staining. Obviously, this has tremendous clinical relevance. If you're a neurointerventionalist and neurocritical care doctor like uh, Dr. Naguera, this sort of information can be very helpful, although obviously the staining overcalls the degree of hemorrhage. Uh, and as Vitor mentioned, your ability to visualize posterior fossa imaging, the brain stem, the midbrain, the fourth ventricle, this was impossible in previous generations because of the bony artifact. Now all of a sudden we have a way to look uh, into this anatomy, obviously very important anatomy for what we do. And then I think uh, we've seen the utility of this too, but the ability to uh, see 4D DSA for an AVM is almost revolutionary. If we're going to be more aggressive with transvenous and, and endovascular approaches to AVMs, you must know what the anatomy is. You must know if there are associated aneurysms, where exactly the vein is and how to turn that. Uh, in, a, in a busy situation where you're distracted, the ability to see this very clearly helps you to avoid errors and to do uh, good planning for good treatment. Uh, and the same with perforators. Uh, again, uh, if you look at the visualization of the pontine perforators, extraordinarily important arteries, uh, here you can see them very clearly. And so as we argue about how best to treat a patient with a mid-basilar stenosis, visualization of these perforators, I think, is, is getting to the point where we're provided information that we could only guess about before. Uh, we're getting more and more complex treatments. We're getting more and more retreatments. Uh, I still believe that the safety of what we're doing is so excellent that if a patient comes back seven years after a treatment and you need to treat them again, that's fine. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, but sometimes the coils or the web, it gets in the way of you understanding the vascular spaces. And so this, these improvements, I think, are directly relevant to our ability to take care of patients. And then finally, um, even for open surgical treatments, this was a, a, a large uh, AVM of the jaw. Uh, treated at the University of Wisconsin, but you can see that the preoperative visualization is, is absolutely superb. And then the postoperative visualization to make sure that you've gotten everything treated the way it, it should be treated and that you can provide some security for the patient and the family that they've had a complete treatment. Same, same images here in a different plane. So I apologize for going quickly and for the slide problems. Uh, but commercially available in the latest version from Siemens, the Icono, uh, you have very efficient image acquisition. As Raul pointed out, at the moment, it's not both planes generating images, but this is coming. You're able to visualize collaterals and get perfusion images dynamic with 10 uh, different phases. Uh, you're able to get rapid imaging from this. And then much better imaging of the parenchyma, the perforators, uh, and time-resolved filling of arteriovenous malformations. So uh, while I love the devices that were uh, being given, uh, I would argue that uh, 
working with uh, our, our imaging partners, as, as Vitor has done, as, as they've done as Bicetra, is maybe one of the most high yield forms of interest we can, uh, forms of research that we can do in terms of improvements for patients. Thank you for your patience in listening to that. I think Vitor's up again now. Can I ask a quick question? Um, Adam, you mentioned uh, the hemorrhage detection. Um, and uh, of course, it's, that's the big, the big problem with CT after thrombectomy is that you can't differentiate between contrast and blood. My understanding is that this Icono will also have dual energy capability. Can you comment on that? I, I don't believe that's commercially available at this moment, but yes, my understanding is that that's going to be available. And I, I, you're, you're obviously thinking uh, in a very clear way about clinical benefits of this because it would be fantastic to be able to know with absolute certainty what is simply contrast staining and what is actual hemorrhage. And so looking at the Hounsfield units, getting dual energy CT, I don't think that's too far away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adam. So hello again. So we will uh, uh, thank you, Siemens, for inviting us to speak on our on impact of robotics and neurovascular intervention. So you guys have seen uh, some of the, the of the presentations that we did on the master class and the two cases here. And uh, since 2019, is a reality for us in Toronto. This, these are our disclosures. So when we think that what was a conference in the past and what uh, Lohan and Professor Moray can do in this stage and have this quality of imaging and this transmission, we, we know that everything in life evolves, surgery as well. We are in an era of innovations with a lot of things completely different than uh, even 10, 20 years ago in robotics on top of that is dominating the scene in different domains. Some industries are now completely automated with robots working 24 hours. And uh, in medicine, robots are already present. So we are probably on the last uh, application of the robots on the surgery side compared to other areas and even other hospitals. I just found out that our pharmacy is completely robotic, finding the medications and preparing the dose for, for the patients. So the first surgical robot is not that uh, old. As Mayank said, in, I think on the first day I was listening from Toronto, the first robot was actually uh, used for the first time in, in Vancouver in 1983. Then different generations of uh, robots to help knee surgery were created until getting to the more widely used robots like the Da Vinci and the Rosa. And today, more than 50,000 surgeons are trained in robots. Orthopedic surgery is getting back to, to, to the scene with a mass of robots and some robots that actually are even increasing or the safety of, of the procedure uh, based on their initial data. So we the, for surgery, this is, is already a reality. And when we think that on our side, what we can do manually and, and compare to surgery, are uh, a sequence of movements that can, we can replicate with the robot. So I'm here deploying on a model, um, a pipeline device. <coughs> and uh, here with the robot, replicating the same movements this is an off-label use of the device, but uh, for when the device will be approved widely, this is a perfect indication for, for the robot as well because you can control very well the movements. And similar to what we did manually, uh, the robot, we can do with the robot. This is a completely master-slave system, but you can perform the procedures the way you would be doing manually. The difference is that to get your hands to do what we can do today, it takes many years. And I've seen with the robots, even young fellows that don't know how to do manual, 
you can coach and they can actually perform and control things like slack, like uh, tension on the system, way easier using the robot. So some of the advantages that we see today that are undeniable, the radiation protection. And it's not only for, for the operator, the bedside team as well. They load the device, they step away. Those new machines today, they have a very low uh, radiation, even a few steps out of the, 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 the X-ray source. So this is a true value. So we did a study a couple of years ago when I was still in Switzerland. Uh, with different procedures, we had uh, radiation detectors, and actually, stroke is actually a pretty important source of, uh, of radiation for us. And we actually tested uh, the value of protective caps, and uh, uh, obviously, we showed that the glasses were the, the, the biggest protection for radiation. But you can see here that we still are very, uh, pretty exposed with doses that over time are not significant. So we should think about that. Uh, that is a true uh, uh, benefit of the robot. Plus the ergonomy, you will do an operation that sometimes it will take hours. If you would do multiple procedures a day, uh, you will be comfortably sitting without the lead and the precision. I, I will bring it up at the end of this talk as well. So we are talking about here the core path GRX, which is the only system that can is allowed or approved to perform neuro interventions that we are assessing on a study with it. So it's, it's the arm that you saw yesterday and that is connected. There is a removable part that is the cassette that we connect to the patient and a console that we have this console, but we can also put in two other rooms uh, in our angel area and we can, we can perform the procedure at the same room or in other rooms as well. This is a close view of the console. You have uh, a high definition screen uh, in front of you. You can select and you can uh, have the screens on the distribution that you have. And this is the, the closer view of that console. You can manipulate the micro catheter, micro IR, and the devices. So on that note, uh, there are a lot of preset uh, automated uh, functions that you can use during the procedure. So yesterday, uh, the last two days, I used a lot of those. Sometimes I didn't have time to explain, but those are, are functions that actually help with the precision of, of the robot. So this is an example of uh, ACOM aneurysm. Uh, we can't see here, but it's a pretty, big angle between the aneurysm and, and the artery. And here you, I'm using some of these functions with a speed control to actually catheterize the aneurysm. And then once we are there, we use a function that pin the micro, micro wire and you advance the micro catheter inside the aneurysm. So we do with one movement what we usually do with four hands. So this is an ACOM aneurysm that uh, we treated uh, early this year. And uh, the aneurysm was the, all the ACOM. So we actually came from the right to the left. And you can see inside the aneurysm how we can actually find the exit, navigate the wire distal, and subsequently navigate the microcatheter. We did this as part of the study, so we didn't select easy cases for the study. Actually, we select all possible elective cases that we can perform. We try to push and, and see how far we can, we can get, and, and uh, we, we actually select uh, pretty tough cases for the robot, and we've been able to perform all the intracranial part of the procedure completely uh, robotically. So you see here the wire, I'm just navigating carefully. I could navigate faster, but I like to navigate. So this is just the micro catheter that was advanced. So this is the final result. We deployed a stent and then we came back in and we could coil as we could do manually as well. So this is the, the follow up of the case that we started doing yesterday. Remember that uh, was that large ACOM 9, 10 millimeter we started with a 10 by 30 coil. 
uh, 9 by 30, then it was too small, we changed to uh, nine, uh, 10. And that was the, the first control. And then we put the 9 that we tried before, after. So the first coil, we had this loop that came out, not concerning. So during the, the procedure, we had to adjust the microcatheter. You can see here was a pretty tortuous anatomy. We did this, we would do manually. So we were progressively feeling. We did a cage here, and we had to do a second, ca second cage close to the neck. And this is the progressive feeling. This is a perioperative. And at the end, we were filling the, the neck. Yeah. This is already an intermediate control. And we were filling the neck. And uh, the coils were already being pushed out. And this is the removal of the microcatheter at the end of the last coil. This is the final control of the case. I think we put uh, 12 coils and we did two cages. We we're pretty happy with, with the result. Patient has woke up fine. And this is the 3D after the procedure. So one, I, I observed that there were questions about uh, emergency. So we always have connected to the guiding catheter uh, an RHV to, to place a balloon in case we, we need uh, as an emergency. We never had to do it, but we have it. And someone also asked about uh, the conversion to manual. And this is a video of Nicole, our technologist, actually converting to manual. She has to disconnect the system from the guiding catheter and then opening the cassette, and we have the control if we need. So pretty straightforward. We do this training every, every time we remind, she reminds herself and we train the fellows to get the control. So before every procedure, we try to create uh, uh, procedures similar to aviation that we will uh, actually have uh, everybody train in case we, we have an emer emergency. So this is our experience so far, two flow divertors, 24 stent assisted coiling and one coiling, that was the one from yesterday. We are enrolling patients on the core path GRX study, 10 sites, 120 patients to demonstrate the safety and effectiveness of the technology. And what we learned so far is that for a robotic procedure that's a little bit more planning to adapt the system that you will use to, to the robot. So, we established three levels of difficulty. The posterior fossa, they are aneurysms that are easier to, to access and to treat. So you just need to think if your access will be long or short enough. The ICAs will be probably the same. We always try to use triaxial system to get the support. And the ACOMs and the MCAs are probably the trickiest because you cannot use too long distal access catheters, otherwise you'll have to go too distal and you will lose travel length uh, with this lack. And you may be in a situation that you, you will not be able to deploy a stent, for example, because you will be too distal and the robot will not be able to pull back the microcatheter. So things that we learned and uh, uh, that you just have to adapt Corindus and Siemens, they have a lot of protocols teaching the sites that are in the study, all these technologies. And this is just a, a, a series of every row is a, is a case. Uh, that was the first case we did. A lot of posterior circulation at the beginning. Um, PCOMs, basilitips, flow diverter case and evolve. Those are the follow-ups. Another question that I, I, I heard yesterday about the long-term follow-ups, if we, with robots, we can do the same thing we would do manual, and I'm saying yes. So those are the first six cases we did. This is the, at least the longest follow-up, most of them uh, at least a year, some more. 
and the aneurysms are all completely uh, stable and, and cured. So the, I don't compromise my result. Actually, I optimize because if we think that we can improve the precision of the stent placement, we, we, we can actually improve the results and the coiling, we can coil the aneurysm the same as we would do manually. Those are the, the distal cases, again, we have uh, the access has to be well planned based on the anatomy of the patient, but these are the results that we are we are getting. So, and when we speak about precision in neuro intervention, there is very few little data in the literature. When we see discussions in conferences, we always say that oh, can the robot do like me? As if we were perfect, we were great, but the simulation studies are showing that. Actually, we have about 40% of redundant or mistakes when you simulate neurointervention procedures that you don't perceive, it's not perceptible by the operator that actually a machine can get. So probably there's more behind we think we are and that we are doing that is not visible or we are not capturing yet. So this is an old study from uh, an, an, a system that is not even on the market anymore. They, they, they did an experiment comparing a manual catheterization of a complex left carotid and the robot. And you can see here just the path uh, of conventional and the path of robotics. And you can see here that uh, the robot can at least be more reliable, independent of the operator on the manual and on the conventional. And this is a, uh, this is a uh, slide from a, a surgeon uh, at St. Mike's that does a lot of safety uh, profiling on, on, on procedures and surgeries. He's a laparoscopic surgeon. And he did a prospective study filming everything in the procedure and sending to a center in Holland for an external ed education. And the surgeons, after they would see the video, and they would write down the, the complications and the problems that they saw. And 75%, uh, the, uh, the, the educators could, fi could find up to 75% of, of adverse events that the operators didn't report. So if we will look into the precision, we may not be as precise. So the surgeons are way more advanced. This system now has an AI tool that is actually using to give feedback to the surgeons and to the residents. And I think, uh, yeah, uh, I like to compare, and that was a comparison that I have to give the credits to Professor Moret when he came to visit and use the robots to with us. We, we're talking about what robots would compare to. And I think this is what it compares the best with uh, an aviation. It, it evolved so much from the 50s to now it's so safe, automated. It's not a robot, but I'm speaking about automation. And the pilots are still there. Instead of two, we have four pilots for the big planes and for the long flights. And uh, I don't, the fear that I, I hear from some people that if we automate the robots, if we we'll do the robots, uh, we will lose our jobs. I don't think that's the case. It will actually increase the safety of the procedure, make it more precise. And I think at least that's what I'm, wishing for and I'm looking forward to seeing on the robots. And the consequence of that was the improve of safety uh, on, on, the, on the aircraft uh, by improving the automation and by improving uh, the technology. So I think we should do the same uh, if we want to get to that level of, of, of safety. So the perspectives for robotics is on that direction. There is a lot of uh, imaging and robotic guidance uh, uh, integration, a lot of projects on automation, some steps that for us are repetitive, you know, catheterization of a carotid, the robot can do probably with, with additional senses. I think this is a promising area. Uh, prescriptive analytics to give us feedback on how we can improve, to give feedback to the fellows. That those are all promising uh, features of the robot, but, uh, the remote is for sure what is enchanting and what will be certainly transformative in this field. This is the map of access of stroke in, in, in US. This is in Ontario. 
So we still have a, a, an in, a, a quality problem with access. Remote areas are, are, don't have the same access to stroke. And the time, particularly in countries like uh, us in Canada, from uh, this, some remote communities to the sites are prohibitive. To, we, we don't even accept patients in certain locations with 200, 300,000 patients that live in, in, in remote areas. So this cannot continue. Uh, that is a distance, that is a geographical distance. And the way to fix that for sure is uh, with remote surgery. The, the cardiac assist uh, teams are already uh, advanced. So they have done different remote procedures from same room, same hospital, different control rooms. And two, three years ago in India, Dr. Patel did five cases 20 miles away, demonstrating the feasibility. This is a, was a non-commercial system, was a prototype that was done for that. But Corindus is starting a study soon in US to use uh, uh, remote surgery for uh, coronary uh, interventions. Uh, this is a part of their study. They actually did a simulation from uh, west, uh, east to west in US, and they studied different connectivities, and certainly 5G will help and facilitate the access to this technology in different areas. So there is a lot to come, very promising field. As you can imagine, I'm very op optimistic and I'm, 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 I, I think we will all be in this field in the, in the five to 10 years to come. So uh, with that, I thank, you, I thank my team that uh, helped me in this journey, Nicole, Julian that was here, and I thank Siemens for the invitation and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Victor. You, you made a very beautiful demonstration during the live transmission of the case of what you can do. We have a, a better understanding of what's uh, going to be the future. Uh, there is definitely future for this. Uh, we have to fix uh, the best uh, indication, but uh, obviously there is future for that, uh, no question. So do you have any comment again for the uh, robotic uh, approach of the... I also, I think everybody agrees that, it, the, that this has future. Um, and um, uh, it's a matter of, of when, not if. But I'm wondering, uh, Vitor, they started with the the cath labs, right? And uh, the cath lab development, the, the coronary work has been a bit ahead of stroke. And it has not um, uh, established itself nearly close as, as something close to standard. Um, how do you think stroke or stroke, uh, neurointerventional is different? Um, and what do you think needs to happen in order for this to become mainstream? Yeah, very good point. So car cardiology, they have uh, way more centers than, than us. So they are pretty, even small centers, small cities, sometimes they, they have STEMI. If you see the STEMI distribution in US, it's, it's like 40, almost 50% compared to 20% that we, you have on stroke. Uh, they didn't buy the the idea of the robot because their the robot doesn't help their procedures too much. For them, it's mainly the radiation protection. So they don't use the robot regularly. As for us, I would see a precision in a stent placement as an advantage. So for them, the local use is based on the, on, on the radiation protection mainly. And the remoteness, the technology is not there yet. So you, it will, they will start a study, I think, from that study, we will see a boom in the cardiology that will actually help us because we will have all the, the communication companies pushing for that. I think for us, uh, we are missing a robot that can do more steps on the stroke procedure. For us, getting the access to the supraortic vessels is probably the toughest or one of the top, toughest part of the procedure. So uh, I, I, I know 
that Siemens is working on a robot that will have different heads that will be able to do uh, a procedure from the groin until the end. And I think we, are, we, we need that and we need the connectivity and the telepresence systems so we can comfortably be doing a procedure remotely and, 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 and communicating properly and having the, 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 the control on the bad side. Because when you start doing robotic procedures, the first thing that I, I actually had was to be used to not be on the bad side, not control your RHVs, not touch your devices. That is a, and when we will be working remote, we will need a telepresence that will support that as well. Thank you, Vito. We, uh, thanks for the explanation and thanks for all what you did and the nice cases you presented.